Welcome to Optimal Anesthesia. This episode will delve into the intricate world of airway management. Today, we're exploring ventilation strategies during the challenging open airway phase of tracheal surgery. This phase requires a delicate balance of providing adequate ventilation, maintaining a clear surgical field, and ensuring patient safety. Let's break down the key techniques and their unique advantages and disadvantages. First up, we have distal tracheal intubation with cross-field ventilation. This is a tried and tested method. Here's how it works. A sterile reinforced endotracheal tube is used to intubate the distal trachea before surgery begins. Cross-field ventilation is then carried out using a fresh sterile anesthetic circuit placed over the surgical drapes and connected to the anesthesia machine. After initial intubation, the oral endobronchial tube is withdrawn and replaced with a regular endotracheal tube placed proximal to the stenosis. The surgery proceeds with the apnea ventilation apnea technique, facilitating the resection and anastomosis of the trachea. The key advantage here is its reliability and the controlled environment it provides. However, it can compromise surgical exposure and has potential complications, such as airway injury and disruption of friable tissue. Next, let's discuss jet ventilation. This method was pioneered by Sanders and has been in use since the 1970s. It's quite fascinating, jet ventilation delivers inspiratory flows using intermittent jets of gas under pressure, typically between 15 to 20 psi. It can use either low frequency, 10 to 20 breaths per minute, or high frequency, 100 to 400 breaths per minute, gas flow. The big plus here is that it provides a clear surgical field and is relatively easy to use without needing special equipment. On the flip side, it can contaminate the distal trachea with blood and debris, generate auto-peep, and there's a risk of tracheal laceration and pneumothorax. Another technique is high-frequency positive pressure ventilation. This one uses a multi-orifice insufflation device, it delivers minimal tidal volumes of 3 to 5 milliliters per kilogram at a respiratory rate of around 60 breaths per minute. This method allows for a relatively still surgical field and gives enough time for complete tracheal anastomosis in one go. However, it comes with its own set of challenges, including the risk of barotrauma and the difficulty in monitoring and quantifying ventilation. Finally, we have cardiopulmonary bypass and extracorporeal oxygenation. This is a more advanced and situation-specific method. CPB was one of the earliest methods used for carinal tumors and required systemic anticoagulation. More recently, venovenous and extracorporeal membrane oxygenation have become safer alternatives with lower anticoagulation requirements. ECMO is particularly beneficial in complex cases, such as small children undergoing tracheoplasty or adults with combined cardiac and pulmonary procedures. With advancements in ECMO technology, especially with peripheral vascular cannulation, the need for anticoagulation has significantly decreased, making it a safer option. So, what's the takeaway? Each of these ventilation strategies has its own set of advantages and disadvantages. There's no one-size-fits-all solution, and the choice of technique must be tailored to the individual patient's needs, airway pathology, and overall health. Thank you for joining Optimal Anesthesia on this deep dive into ventilation strategies during the open airway phase of tracheal surgery. If you found this episode insightful, please subscribe and share it with your colleagues. Until next time, keep breathing easy and stay curious.